The Bottle House National Landmark Museum can be found and held in New Jersey. It is known as the place where labor workers went on strike in 1913 and fought for what they believed were equal working rights. The Bottle House is a national landmark building meaning that uh, an event in history took place there that changed our entire nation. And what happened at the Botto House National Landmark in 1913 is that it became a meeting place for nearly 25,000 striking silk mill workers who were fighting for an eight-hour day. It is also the headquarters of the American Labor Museum, the only museum of its kind in the nation dedicated to the history of workers and their organizations with a special focus on immigrants. And thirdly, uh, it is Labor Schoolhouse. Many of those who visit the museum will be future workers and we are looking to share with them not only history, but lessons on how they can take care of their safety and their welfare as working people. Pietro and Maria Botto were Italian immigrants who settled in Haledon, New Jersey and worked in Patterson Silk Mills. To me, and I think to those who visit the museum and learn more about them, they understand that as immigrant workers, they were heroes heroines of um, working people. They offered their home uh, as a meeting place during a strike for an eight-hour day. The strike was also about ending child labor and protecting worker safety on the job. So they were real heroes uh, of working families. The house is a monument to immigrant workers who were seeking to live the ideals of our country, um, equal citizenship for those who live here. And it also is a, a reminder that workers today and in the future um, are playing a role in shaping our country's future. So that's what it represents. Every Sunday, an IWW, a wobbly organizer, would address the crowds. Most of the time, it was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a woman, 22 years old, uh, who would address the crowds in English. She was descendant of Irish immigrants. Often joining her was Carlo Tresca, an Italian organizer who spoke in Italian so that everyone could understand the issues of the strike and how any types of negotiations might be progressing. The speaker spoke in the languages of the workers. The workers had learned through the years that differences in culture was used in the factories to divide them and conquer them. And they were determined during this strike that they would not be divided. Solidarity was their greatest strength. So they communicated the same issues one to one another, but in their own native languages so everyone could understand. There were some very famous speakers who talked during the strike, too, from the balcony. Upton Sinclair, the writer, uh, the author of The Jungle. Uh, sometimes we learn about him in schools as a muckraker, uh, interested journalists, um, New York City bohemians, sometimes they were called, who were interested in helping these industrial workers and these immigrant workers. He spoke from the balcony and was nervous. He never spoke to such a large crowd of people. Hubert Henry Harrison, an Afro-Caribbean, self-taught socialist thinker, very well known in his day, virtually forgotten today, he was a very important speaker uh, for working families, for unions, and for those who ran for political office under the Socialist Party ticket. Now, the borough of Haledon, where Pietro and Maria Bado lived, was a community of northern Italian silk mill workers. These residents had elected a socialist mayor of Haledon. His name was Mayor William Brookman. He was a German immigrant. And the socialist political point of view was of interest to many working people. So there were speakers who spoke 
uh, from this point of view from the balcony as well. There were workers who came forward, shop stewards. There were workers who played musical instruments and they would use the meetings in Haldon like a pep rally. Someone would play a guitar or a mandolin, a familiar song, a tune that everyone knew, and they would make up new words to the song. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, she's our woman. We want to follow her. They would make up new words to give everyone a chance to lift their spirits. The strike was a difficult time. Some families were down to one meal a day, and some uh, feared eviction and loss of their homes. So these weekly meetings were very, very important. Olga Botto, the youngest Botto daughter, was the water girl. So when you arrived at the Botto house to give a speech, she was at the top of the stairs to give you a little water before you stepped out on the balcony to face the crowds. Sometimes the crowd was 3,000 workers, sometimes 20,000 workers gathered in front of the Botto's home. The 1913 Patterson Silk Strike was a general strike of textile factory workers. It began in one plant uh, among weavers over an increase in loom assignment from two looms to four looms per worker with no increase in wages and unemployment would have been the result. So those workers walked out in January of 1913 to protest this speed up as they called it. They were followed a month later by everyone else in the industry, skilled and unskilled workers, men, women, and children, uh, families who represented nine different ethnic groups. The workforce was primarily immigrant workers from European silk centers. Uh, there were some workers from the Middle East, very few Spanish speaking at that time, but in the mills you would have heard German and French spoken, Polish, Russian. It was a mixed group of workers. So by February, nearly 25,000 were out on strike, and Patterson was pretty much shut down. If you didn't work in the silk mills, you knew somebody who did. You had a business that was patronized by silk mill workers. This strike extended through the summer months. It did not end until August 3rd, officially, 1913. So it was a long struggle that was known for non-violence. The workers agreed not to resort to violence, that that would hurt their strike. And they utilized some new um, techniques to publicize, to teach the public about the working conditions of the mills. For example, they um, sent their children, the strikers, to live with sympathetic families for the duration of the strike so that they could continue picket line duties. And when children were taken by train to live with other families, the event was used as a publicity tool uh, newspaper reporters, journalists wrote about how families were being split up during the strike. The workers invited organizers from the Industrial Workers of the World, nicknamed the Wobblies, a union, a radical union. Uh, these organizers came to Patterson to advise the strikers and held meetings with the strikers in the city of Patterson. When those meeting halls were closed to the workers, they traveled um, barely a mile away to the borough of Haldon, bordering Patterson, and met on the field in front of the home of workers Pietro and Maria Botto. And the second floor balcony served as a speaker's platform. So the Bottos offered their home, opened their home to the strikers and their organizers. Every Sunday, workers would come to Haldon for those meetings. The strike ended with a mixed bag. The workers did not win. We say they were starved back to work. Uh, they did not win the, what became their main demand, an eight-hour day. They did save some jobs. The four-loom system was never put into place, so they put off unemployment for a short time. The city of Patterson's History is, is as old as our nation's history. Um, Alexander Hamilton's statue 
overlooking the falls is part of, of that story. It tells us that the um, city is a city of entrepreneurs. Um, we can go there and visit the factories, the factory buildings, some of which, um, the remains of which are still standing from over 200 years ago. But we have to remember that what brought the factories and the industry there, if we are not going to be um, so industrialized any longer because commerce and economies change, that the basis of that industrial growth was entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, which came from immigrants. Some of the textile industry that came to Patterson, there are really great stories about how entrepreneurs went to factories in Great Britain where there were textile production and would sneak and try to steal peeks at the technology in those factories to bring them back here to Patterson. So it's the entrepreneurial spirit that I think will transform Patterson in ways that we don't totally know yet. Um, if you look at the city now, there are many new waves of immigrants who are very successfully living and working in Patterson and developing communities of their own. So there was a Dublin section in Patterson a long time ago where the Irish lived. There are new neighborhoods, Arabic speaking, with businesses that cater to those workers. And there is, as there was in the days of Silk City, um, the silk industry prospered in Patterson because there were protective tariffs established by the federal government that allowed the industry a little edge to grow and prosper so that it became cheaper for you to buy silk Perch, um, excuse me, manufactured in Patterson than silk made in other silk centers around the world. So there are uh, government efforts to help business flourish in Patterson. So I think we'll see growth in a lot of areas. There was just a film made not too long ago in Patterson. So even in the arts in Patterson, in Passaic County, there is growth. Some of the factory buildings are used for art purposes, not only for business, uh, nonprofits, and um, other types of enterprises. So I can't really say specifically what will come there, but I think there are seeds for a lot of growth in Patterson. So I'm looking forward to seeing what will happen in the future. Uh, working people today have many challenges, um, similar ones to in the past and new ones. Um, in my view, it's very important for workers to understand their rights on the job and the value of collective action. Um, you not only need to know your individual rights, but it's important to look out for your fellow workers and to understand the history of the labor movement, of organized labor. Many, um, or we cannot, take for granted some of the benefits that we have in workplaces today. Overtime pay, child labor laws, safety protections in workplaces. Um, we don't want to repeat history and have to struggle all over again for some of the benefits that we have. And those benefits make us better workers and they will make workplaces better for those coming after us. So I think it's very important um, that we seriously take a look at the value of organized labor and support the labor movement and learn as much about it as we can because many of the labor unions and those who make them up, workers who are skilled and unskilled, um, have really great ideas about improving working conditions and improving the products and the output of their workplaces. And that makes our country stronger and better all the way around.